Hello. In this lecture, which is part of the series on MRI pulse sequences for neuroimaging research, we'll be talking about a few additional RF pulses. First, crusher gradients. As I've mentioned in some of my previous talks, when we're acquiring the data, we're acquiring, in this case, multiple lines of K-space with multiple excitations. And depending on the repetition time, or TR, that we have, uh, the uh, tissues uh, longitudinal magnetization may not have recovered all the way before we may excite the spins again. And this is what provides some T1 contrast. However, another important part of this is that if the, magnetiz the magnetization vector is not fully relaxed back, uh, its longitudinal magnetization, in addition, it's also possible that there's still some transverse magnetization left. If that's the case, then if we send in immediately another RF pulse, then the transverse magnetization would also be flipped, in this case, perhaps into the longitudinal plane, and eventually uh, might come back as some additional echoes. So these can cause some distortions. And so one way to deal with this additional signal is to apply what are called crusher gradients. That is, after we've acquired our data, we apply additional gradients at the end of the sequence to remove any transverse magnetization. Uh, then we can go on with our typical imaging. You'll also see that these crusher gradients uh, play a role when we're doing certain kinds of preparation pulses. So these preparation pulses can also be used to give us additional contrast in our imaging. For example, we could do inversion recovery or saturation recovery or diffusion weighting. What these pulses are are basically additional RF pulses that are played before you actually begin your data acquisition. In this case, uh, as illustrated here, they're called planar imaging acquisition. So for example, in this case, this is what we call a saturation recovery. Uh, we, we could use this for some uh, T1 weighting. That is, if we apply a 90 degree pulse, wait a certain period of time, and then remove the remaining uh, transverse magnetization and then acquire our data, what happens is that these, uh, the signals will not have fully recovered, uh, depending on they'll have recovered depending on the T1s. Uh, and so using this, basically, you can accentuate some of the T1 contrast. I mean, we saw this concept uh, previously just based on the TR, uh, the times between the different repetition pulses uh, that we can get some T1 way to contrast. Another way to accentuate that contrast is what we call inversion recovery. That is, in a di instead of a acquiring or a sending in a 90 degree pulse initially, we can apply initially a 180 degree pulse. So what that does is it flips the magnetization from being perfectly vertical to being exactly opposite. Then that magnetization recovers along that axis and slowly relaxes back. So if we plot that longitudinal magnetization over time, this is what the recovery would look like. But we can then choose to acquire the data at some point in time later. And in particular, if we acquire the data at this point right here, then whatever tissue has this particular T1 relaxation rate will contribute no signal. So for example, we can create images where we have removed the signal from the CSF, that is all the signal from the CSF will appear black or dark in the image. It's a technique called CSF nulling. So we apply 180 degree pulse, we wait for a certain period of time until uh, that uh, T1 uh, crosses the zero, uh, and then we crush the remaining transverse magnetization and then acquire our image from that. Another radio frequency pulse that you might see is what's called fat suppression. Now, generally, when we're looking at MRI, we're really just imaging water. However, there's other uh, molecules, in particular, if we're looking at hydrogen uh, MRI, there are other molecules that hydrogen is bound to that also contribute some sort of signal. Now, in generally, most of these are really, really small compared to the water. However, one peak that is still somewhat significant is the lipids or the fat. Uh, that can still contribute some amount of signal, except it's displaced a little bit. That is, it resonates at a slightly different frequency than water. And this is essentially what you would get with magnetic resonance spectroscopy, right? Now, uh, what effect that has is, remember, with MRI, we're trying to use the frequency of the spins as the position. We're using gradients to encode the frequencies. Uh, and so, as you can see here in this image, 
the fact that it's actually resonating at a different frequency causes a ghost of this object uh, displaced a little bit. So this is actually the fat that's around, uh, the subcutaneous fat around the person's head in the tissue there. Um, and it is displaced a little bit uh, from that. Now, one way we can correct for that would be to send in a 90 degree RF pulse at a slightly different frequency, that is one that matches the uh, fat peak, then crush that magnetization and then continue our imaging sequence. Now, another solution to try to fix that would be, of course, turning on the fat suppression if it wasn't on to begin with, uh, but also this fat suppression loses its effectiveness if you have magnetic field non-uniformities. Uh, that is, if the fat peak isn't exactly where you expect it to be in terms of its resonant frequency, the fat suppression is not going to be as effective. Uh, and so improving the shim, that is improving the uniformity of the magnetic field can help with that. And finally, we can look at some other preparation pulses uh, that encode motion, particular say the flow or diffusion. So for example, if we apply this bipolar uh, gradient, that is we first apply a gradient in one direction, it's in a negative x direction, and then uh, turn it on in the opposite direction for the same amount of time, so the area of these two would be the same. And I think, well, what does that really do? Well, if your spin is perfectly stationary, it, it's, it, the, the spins or the magnetization vectors get twisted up and then untwisted by exactly the same amount in this uh, second lobe. However, if the spins are moving, then we'll have experienced one particular field during this period of time and then during the opposite period of time when they would be unwrapped again, they're actually in a different magnetic field. And so the unwrapping is not as successful. So it's not completely unwrapped or maybe unwrapped too much. And so as a result of that, any moving spins will be dephased and we have less signal from moving spins that are moving in this particular direction. So we can then repeat this procedure, applying gradients in the bipolar gradients in the other directions in order to encode the directions that the uh, magnetization is either flowing or is diffusing, is moving around. And this is the basis for diffusion-weighted imaging. And Dr. Andy Alexander will get into a lot more detail uh, on that in his lecture. And finally, a note about slice acquisition. So far, when I've been talking about acquiring two-dimensional slices in a series, um, the way you might imagine that we acquire it is in a sequential fashion, such as here. Now, if we acquire them in the sequential fashion, one of the problems is that the slices are not perfectly, don't have a perfectly rectangular shape. Uh, that is, if we look at them edge on in terms of the amount of signal, they're not perfectly square. There may be a little bit of sort of tapering off of the signal. Uh, and then if you look at the neighboring slices, there's a little bit of overlap between the two. Now, one of the problems this causes is that if we acquire the data sequentially, then when we're acquiring the second slice that's immediately adjacent to this one, this signal right here will have been acquired a very short time, maybe just tens of milliseconds before the signal that we're acquiring. So all of that signal won't have fully recovered its longitudinal magnetization and we're missing that signal. Uh, and so as a result, we actually get less signal from the sequential acquisition. One way around that is to what, go to what's called an interleaved acquisition. So if instead of acquiring all of the slices sequentially, as shown here on top, we acquire, let's say, all of the odd slices first and then all the even numbered slices, then let's say if we're doing this with say echoplanar imaging we're acquiring a slice every 50 milliseconds we acquire the entire volume of 40 slices in two seconds then by the time we go back to collect these images here a whole second will have passed uh, relative to when this first slice was acquired so a lot of longitudinal magnetization will have already recovered and we won't lose as much signal from this part of the slice and in contrast for the sequential acquisition you know, that signal will only have been acquired about 50 milliseconds beforehand, and so a lot of that magnetization is still gone. It's not, hasn't been fully recovered. So this is important to know, particularly for functional MRI, um, because we're looking at trying to track when signal changes are occurring, and we have to remember that the data uh, for the entire volume are not all acquired at the same time, but rather are spread out over, let's say, uh, one to two seconds. So we have got to correct for that. And so knowing how the data are acquired is really important for that.